Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for the longest while, I have not heard a debate of this type where every device known to language has been employed to stay away and to deviate from the issue that is before the house. Yes. <laughs> we heard about the glories of the 50th anniversary. Yeah, man. We heard about the thousands of people who came to celebrate. Yes. We heard about the fact that we, 32 on this side, were not offered seating accommodation. We heard about so many things accepting the simple requests which this motion <coughs> makes. Simple requests that the motion make. And sir, it is the second time that the important question of transparency and accountability is presented in this house in a very frontal way and those who now occupy the seats of government and who made that their watchword over the last five years and they spoke about it at every conceivable fora in this country, at every street corner and in every media house and made it such a national watchword that I don't know what is going through the mind of the Guyanese people now when, when they are confronted with the simple questions of accountability and transparency, there is this great attempt to elude and delude. Mr. Speaker, we had a simple motion a few months ago that called upon the government side of the, call upon all members of parliament to declare their integrity declarations as a mechanism and a measure and an exemplification of accountability and transparency. We ask that we disclose their tax returns over the last 15 years, again, as an exemplification of accountability and transparency. And they rejected that motion. And now again, we have a very simple opportunity, uncomplicated, unsophisticated opportunity to answer a few questions about a mega project, and they boast about it as being a major pro mega project, and I don't want to get into the merits or the demerits of it. All I want to know, sir, is who threw two truckloads, sir? What's the name of the fellow who told truth talk to son? I want to know who we the grass, who cut the pristine forest. That's all we are asking. That's all this motion seeks to do. And every mechanism, every linguistic mechanism is used to shy away from that very simple exercise. Mr. Speaker, for the record, I want to read the motion into the answer because subsequently, one who undertakes to follow this debate may have great difficulty in understanding what the motion is because nothing that the motion speaks about is spoken to by the other side. And the motion asks for some simple questions. I will go through just the resolve clauses. That this National Assembly in the interest of public accountability, transparency and good governance, very high ideals to which we all commit ourselves, calls upon the government to make full disclosure on the following. It's as simple as that. Make full disclosure in the interest of public accountability, transparency, and good governance. Well,
if the other side is not committed to that, I suppose they will, that's why we are engaging in this, this attempt to divert. But this is what it asks for. One, the names of the individuals and private organizations which were in charge of this project from its inception to April takeover by the Ministry of Infrastructure. Who are the people? Why are we, move, why are we engaging in this circumlocutious and circ circuitous exercise? Why just not tell us the names of the people who are in charge of the project? I know a few, I know them personally, but this motion was designed to get it from the government. And for the life of me, I don't understand why such simple questions can't be answered. That's one. Two, who are the donors and their contributions in cash or kind who contributed to the initial phase and completion of the Jubilee Park developmental project? We were told that the nation was told that donations were made, that party supporters, patriotic Guyanese, nationalist persons who are endowed with nationalistic sentiments, philanthropists, charitable organizations, all came forward in all their glory. So happy they were to celebrate with us that 50th anniversary that they came and they poured their goodwill in kind and in assets. And all we are asking, sir, who are these people? Give us their names, give us the name of the company, and what, what little Dachna did they give? <laughs> What did they give? That's all we are asking. And then the second one. The third one. Inform the House whether any and which of these contributions were submitted to the Consolidated Fund, if any at all. And my honorable colleague, the honorable Irfan Ali, detailed the legal obligation, both in the Constitution and in the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act to put monies in the, in the consolidated fund. And then it comes back out here. Something that Mr. Ramjitan is very much acquainted with. And I don't understand why he doesn't use his vice presidential power to persuade his government to tell us how much of this money was put in the, 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 the consolidated fund. He journeyed all the way to Ivleri once to make a report as he pursued this high ideal of his, of getting all monies in the consolidated fund. And here it is, a glorious opportunity is presented to him. But he has authority. And, and he doesn't try to persuade his government. Oh, man. And then, sir, Poor care. we want the list of contractors and the process of procurement used to secure those engaged. So all we want is the list of the contractors. Well, my, my honorable friend, the minister within the ministry, offered us some information which I find very intriguing. The honorable member said that they had a list of contractors whom they call and some process was engaged in. The honorable member described using terminology of public procurement process, but we are saying exactly that. That did not happen. And one would have expected that the honorable member would have produced a piece of newspaper or take her seat, <laughs> as is the recent practice in the Where house. Leave the house. But not a shred of evidence. Just a bald statement. Just a bald statement that public procurement was done. And then, to increase the drama, to increase the drama, the honorable minister holds up two hands hard. I said, it's all in here. It's all in here. But, Mr. Speaker, we are asking if that was it, then that should have been identified and sent to us. I know it is not there. It is not there. The true picture is not there. The true picture is not there. And then, sir, the budgeted and actual cost of every phase of the project completed and the projected final cost for the overall project. Why is it that we can't have 
such very simple and elementary information. Any person who engages in any type of cost assessment of any given project would be able to see, break it up into phases, and say what is the cost of this phase, what is the cost of this phase, and the uncompleted phase will cost X. And that's all we are asking. And that is so difficult to do. And then it asks another simple question. The payments made to individual contractors and companies as it relates to the project. You must have as competent persons who are in charge of the public purse and who are administering public finances from whichever source it comes, once it relates to a state project, a public project, it becomes public financing. And you are obliged to keep that kind of information in a manner of, in, in that manner. Because the law imposes that kind of obligation. Your permanent secretaries know that. That is the obligation of the, the, the accounting officers of these agencies. I see some of them in the house. But I'm sure that the request was not made. Or there is no information. Because no record was kept of this particular transaction. And then, sir, we have seven, the liabilities, if any, to any individual contractors and companies that are owed for works and for services provided. Well, sir, my information is that the list is very long of persons who have not been paid and who have rendered services on this project. And we are asking to know who these, who these people are. This is not secret information. This is not a minister building an individual house. This, as you said, is a project of national importance and this is a matter of national public importance. And it concerns accountability and good governance, something that you promised the people of Guyana, earnestly and honestly. And I presume that you are committed to that objective. So why not tell us how much money is owed? And then, who is the agency that is now assigned for the day-to-day -day management and caretaking of the facility. I saw one <coughs> newspaper columnist said that Wodans is infesting the place. Public monies were spent, whether they were donated freely, whether they were hard-earned taxpayers' money, we don't know. But monies were spent, and the facilities, any one of us who passed there, you see that the facilities is without any supervision. Cows are grazing, horses are grazing, and based upon what this author said in the newspaper, the place is infested with wood ants. So we want to know who is the person or entity engaged in the process of caretaking and managing this grand facility, which will remain etched in our history as the edifice or the center of our 50th anniversary celebration. 50 years from now, I presume that we would want to have that edifice or that site um, still be there so that we can show our generations to come that 50 years ago, this is where we did this grand celebration. But if it is being kept in that way and there is neglect and there is disrepair after 18, after a year, what will happen in 50 years? So it's an eminently fair question to ask who is in charge. And we're not getting that kind of information. And then lastly, just tell us an estimate of what it will cost to maintain this facility, I presume, for the, annually. I mean, these, there is nothing, nothing difficult, nothing controversial about these questions. 
And I agree with my, my, my colleague, Honorable Bishop Agil, that it is quite a travesty and an indictment that a motion had to be moved in the first place to extract from the government such vital, rudimentary, and elementary information that's supposed to be available publicly. I see the Honorable Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, making some very caustic remarks about the Commission of Information. Information is lacking in this country. Information is lacking in this country. And this is the place, if there is one place in this land, if there is one institution in our constitutional superstructure where information is supposed to be abound, it is the National Assembly of our country. And we here, not because I want to know whether two or four truckloads of sand were poured there, but there, are a, there is a constituent. There is a constituency out there whom we represent. And they ask us these questions because they are interested. I am sure constituency that may have voted for the government as well, their own constituency. The Honorable Bishop Edgel had cause to say that many of the Honorable Members on the back bench don't know the information themselves, more so the ordinary members of the public. So these are vital information that we are asking, and it is quite unfortunate, sir, that we have to descend to this level, exert so much energy and time, like pulling teeth to get such vital and essential information from a government that committed itself. And sir, I read this document only last night, sir. The Joint Manifesto. And the common thread which runs through this document, almost every theme in it, there is one golden thread. And it is about accountable government. It is about full and frank disclosure of the workings of government and it is about transparency and good governance. That is what this document promised the Guyanese people. And here it is, we have to virtually beg and cajole to get very basic information. And, Mr. and Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I want to I want to refer to the Integrity Commission Act because we heard both on that side as well as in the public sphere that a lot of donations were made towards this project. And somehow, because the rubric of donation was used, some people may have persuaded themselves that there is no obligation to account as you normally would have had to do had it not been donation. But that is not so. My honorable friend, Mr. Irfan Ali, quoted copiously from the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act and identified the sections that says whether the monies are from a, for a social object, whether, whatever source it comes from, once it mingles with public finances and once it enters into the public domain, then it becomes public monies and has to be treated in the manner provided for by the law. But in addition to that, even if we want to play the devil's advocate and treat the monies as donations, well, donations beyond $10,000 from a minister for, a pu for, for donations to a public official of which a minister is a part or any member of the government be would be a part has to be declared to the Integrity Commission. Has to be declared. And a failure to declare it, sir, carries a heavy fine. It is the value of the donation. That is the fine. So I hear all kind of money sums being bandied about. 
400 million, 1.5 billion. That is the fine that you're playing with. Whatever the sum is under the Integrity Commission Act. And then, sir, so I just want to make that point when persons think that the holders of public office can shelter under the protection of a gift. It's not so. We dealt with that, and that's a standard operational procedure in public life and in public office throughout the world. It's a United Nations convention requirement, and we complied with it since 1996. Sir, then we have the Procurement Act. And Section 3 says that this act applies to all procurement by all procuring entities. And of course, a government, any of its ministries, any of its departments, or any state agency are all governed by the Procurement Act. So every single contract, every piece of service that was procured, and every article of goods that was procured towards that project, supposed to have been done in accordance with the Procurement Act. Supposed to have been done in accordance with the Procurement Act, or else it is unlawful. And so we have a ruling from the court and I want to put on the record of this assembly for posterity a case filed by BK International, one of the contractors that I've seen at the project site. BK International 2013-75 CM. And in this case, sir, this contractor went to court to challenge an award of a contract done by the GGMC to another contractor. And the basis of the challenge was that the GGMC did not tender the contract in accordance with the Procurement Act. And the GGMC argument was, well, look, I am a state agency. I am a statutory body corporate. I am not a department of government. I am managed and run by a board. I have the independence to keep my own finances. And therefore, I do not have to comply with the Procurement Act. That the Procurement Act is designed to deal with central government procurement and not me. And Chief Justice Chan, quoting from authorities in India and throughout the Commonwealth, came to the conclusion that the GGMC is so intricately linked to central government with a minister of the government exercising executive control and that minister gets that executive power from the president under Article 99 of the Constitution that you cannot delink an agency of the caliber like the GGMC from the government for the purpose of the Procurement Act. And therefore, the Procurement Act governs all procurement once public monies are involved. So I, whichever agency may have been given the task of and undertaking that project, whichever agency, it cannot hide from the Procurement Act. And I hope the Honorable Minister, who I understand may be speaking after me, can convince us, persuade us, and more importantly, the Guyanese people, that the Procurement Act was complied with and that the entire project was not done unlawfully. So as I wind up, I just want to say quickly, that this motion is a very simple one. All it intended to get from the government is answers to simple questions, answers that should have been furnished to us and we could have been all of us home by now. But unfortunately, the champions of transparency, the champions of, of, honor, of accountability, and the champions of good governance have failed their cause. Thank you very much, sir. I thank the honourable member.